Exciting night at the Rogers Memorial Library. My name is Penny Wright. Many of you I know, and I know there are many of you in this audience who have very fond memories of the Auto Museum. And we are so delighted to have Howard Kropler here tonight to talk about that. And we're also really pleased to have the son of Henry Austin Clark Jr., Hal Clark. Wait. Hal Clark and his wife Pam, who made the trip all the way from Greenwich, Connecticut, but they do not get the prize for the furthest travel because I think we had someone come from Delaware, or did we? Florida. Florida, see? <laughs> and the Virgin Islands, so you see. Okay. So, um, I want to thank you for coming. I also wanted to mention that Swede Edwards, who is a treasurer of information and was an employee, actually Pat was, a, Pat was an employee, Swede was an employee, but Swede, who many of you know, um, brought a whole bunch of pictures there to uh, take a look at after today, after tonight's talk. And also, John Quoka. Where are you, John? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> John brought and assembled these wonderful pieces in the front, including that diorama. Is that what it's called? That he that he constructed of the auto museum. So he has done an awful lot to prepare for today as well. There are some books here in the front that you can browse around and read or buy if you like, but I want to tell you a little bit about Howard Croplet, who, whom we have not met, had not met, and now we have, and we're delighted. Howard is a lifelong Long Island resident and serves as a town historian of North Hempstead and on the town's historic landmark preservation commission. He has lectured extensively on the Vanderbilt Cup races, the Long Island Motorway Parkway, and the history of the town of North Hempstead. <coughs> Howard is the founder and now former owner of The Impact Group, a large Manhattan-based medical communications company that provided medical education programs for the pharmaceutical industry. He earned an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and a bachelor's in engineering from Stony Brook University. He and his wife, Roz, and Roz is here. Hello, Roz. The lovely Roz. The lovely Roz. <laughs> I, I mean, I could say that, but you know, I let you say that. Okay, good. He and his wife, Roz, have been honored by the Child Abuse Prevention Services with the 2007 John Davis Memorial Award in recognition of their commitment to child abuse prevention. Active in various organizations and philanthropies, Howard serves on the Board of Trustees of the Rosalind Landmark Society and the Society for the Preservation of Long Island Antiquities. He's also a member of the Society of Automotive Historians. He is very busy. Um, Howard is the president of the Long Island Motor Parkway Preservation Society. His exhibits on the Vanderbilt Cup races have been shown at various Long Island museums, and over the years he has accumulated an extensive collection of racing memorabilia. Howard Croplet's books include Vanderbilt Cup Races of Long Island, the Long Island Motor Parkway, which was co-authored with Al Veloci and North Hempstead. All bestseller, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> with the help of his daughter, Dana Kyle, Howard Funk founded and created the website VanderbiltCupRaces.com. In 2012, the website was honored with two Webby Awards for the automotive and sports categories, and in 2013, the VanderbiltCupRaces.com was selected by the International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences as one of the five best in the world for car sites and car culture. <clears throat> Howard is well known for his unique car collection. In December of 2008, he bought and restored the 1909 Alco Black Beast Racer that won the 1909 and 1910 <coughs> Vanderbilt Cup races and raced in the first Indy 500 race 
which was in 1911. In celebration of the 100th anniversary of the inaugural Indy 500 race, the Alco Black Beast participated with six other race cars in a parade lap at the 2011 Indy 500 race. The car was driven by two-time Indy 500 winner Emerson Fittipaldi, with Howard as his passenger. In 2012, Howard appeared in the finale of the History Channel's Men Who Built America, driving the Alco Black Beast. He played Alexander Winston, the fastest man alive, racing against novice Henry Ford. <laughs> In March 2014, Howard was profiled in the Velocity Channel series Americana, fe featuring NASCAR racing champion crew chief Ray Evernoon. In 2012, Howard bought a 1937 Chrysler Imperial C15 town car at an auction at the Suffolk County Vanderbilt Museum. This one-of-a-kind car, car nicknamed Chrysler's Chrysler, was custom built by LeBaron for the Chrysler family. And in April 2015, he purchased the unique 1963 Mustang III concept show car, which is considered the oldest Mustang on the road today. Howard has been a die-hard Mets fan, uh-oh. Well, I actually have two, but, um, <laughs> for 50 years, and is often seen behind home plate in the Excelsior level of City Field with his family, the lovely Roz, and friends. <laughs> Waving his Mets flag, please welcome Howard Proffitt. I feel like my life just flashed in front of me. Thank you, Penny, for that uh, great introduction there. And it's a real privilege to be here in Southampton, and it's great to see how uh, here today, or it's a real privilege, it's the first time I met you, we've spoken over the phone, and uh, it's amazing, we have a whole bunch of people here who are associated with the museum. Raise your hand if you worked at the museum. Oh, good. Okay. So look at all the people there. So uh, you guys, you're going to need to help me during the, uh, the presentation identifying some of the elements here. Um, you know, we start out with this picture here, and this, I think this photo kind of captures Henry Austin Clark uh, and, and the museum, the excitement. He always has a smile on his face. He is always having a good time. And Hal told me that he always had a good time. So he's really enjoying himself. Um, so here's a welcome and registration. Um, and we're going to go into the tribute. We're going to talk about Henry Austin Clark. We'll talk about the museum. We'll do a then and now, and we should be able to do this within about 40 minutes, and we'll have some questions, and it will be interactive questions, especially with the people who worked at the museum. Penny did a great job uh, talking about my background here. Um, just to fill you in, I am the town historian in North Hempstead, so I really get involved with a lot of projects, a lot of restoration projects, uh, including this is a... a, a 26-foot statue that we have restored, and it's in the middle of Gary Park in Roslyn. I'm big at uh, restoring cemeteries. This is a Townsend Cemetery that uh, we have restored and cleaned up. And this is the Roslyn Grist Mill that after 40 years of just sitting there decaying, we actually have now acquired a million dollars to begin the restoration. So I was really, I'm really pleased to uh, be involved with that. Um, I'm big on the Long Island Motor Parkway, as some of the people might know here. And I am the former owner and CEO of the Impact Group. I sold the company about 2008 so I could follow my passions. And people say, well, uh, you know, have you retired? I said, no, 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 I'm just refocused. So anybody who says you're retired, you say, no, I'm refocused. So I like that much better. And people ask, what was the Impact Group? And we set up, it started out as a one-person company and we, I grew it to about 150 people with three offices around the country. And we helped pharmaceutical companies introduce new products. And Pfizer was my number one client. So my claim to fame, the reason people know me in the pharmaceutical industry, I helped introduce Viagra to the world. <laughs> there you go, there you go. I, I, I told this to a, a retirement community, I got a standing ovation. <laughs> so, it was really good. That was from the ladies of the, <laughs> the groups. But 
Way about three years before Viagra was ever mentioned, the, the public knew about I was involved in, in uh, working with the Viagra team. I'm still friendly with them. We're going to go to lunch uh, next month. Uh, as I said, we have three books that I have co-authored. These are Arcadia books, uh, one on Vanderbilt Cup races, one on Long Island Motor Parkway, and one on North Hempstead. And then at the end here, for anybody who's interested in this, I will sign the books, and uh, again, they're, they go for about $20, but as a special offer here, in tribute to the museum and, and Henry Austin Clark Jr., it's really whatever you want to contribute, you can get a book. Too. So at the end there, too. And the good thing about this, all proceeds uh, from these kind of presentations and, and from the book signings all go to charities in North Ham. So this will go to Child Abuse Prevention Services, where the lovely Roz is on the board. Um, here again, uh, the one thing I'm very proud of that uh, Penny mentioned, too, is VanderbiltCupRaces.com. And uh, this was a website my daughter and I put together, and it's really taken off. We get about 3,000 hits a, a week now on this. We, we, we talk about the history of racing on Long Island. We have about 30 posts on the Long Island Automotive Museum. Films, uh, photos, rare photos come in. So if you're interested, go to VanderbiltCupRaces.com, and, and what's... Amazing that we were voted one of the top five uh, uh, websites for car culture, and the rest are like Road and Track, Lexus, and VanderbiltCupRaces.com. It was like kind of amazing that we, we got that. So I'm going to pass this around. If you're interested in it, we have a weekly newsletter. If you're interested in it, uh, just put your email address here, and I'll make sure that you get on the list over here. If you can pass that around. Uh, just here briefly talking about the cars here, I, I have, and, and maybe this is why I identify with Henry Austin Clark Jr., because I love old cars, and I love unique cars. So I had uh, my first unique car was a 1966 Shelby Mustang Renter Racer. It was uh, a, a beautiful white, uh, which is rare because they were mainly black and gold. And uh, we, uh, Roz and I, uh, met Carol Shelby, and so you really get to meet some interesting people. Uh, with these cars here. This is the Alco Black Beast. There's a 1909 race car, and uh, that's uh, Emerson Fittipaldi driving me around on the, uh, hundred, the centennial celebration of the Indy 500. Uh, as Penny said, I got to act in uh, The Men Who Built America. I played Alexander Whitkin racing Henry Ford in this one over here, and that's, they, they sometimes replay that on the Velocity Channel too. And here we are, I was profiled on Americana uh, with uh, Ray Everham uh, about, I guess, in 2014, so a lot of fun. And here's a Chrysler Imperial, this is a 1937 uh, Chrysler Imperial town car built uh, by LeBaron, custom made for Walter Chrysler as a gift for his wife. And when I bought this, I bought this from the Suffolk County Vanderbilt Museum, it was in shambles. It was, uh, there was a raccoon living in the back seat, right? And, I, and John and I, my assistant John, we, we, we were actually borrowing another car from the museum, and we went down to this curator's garage, and we saw this 1909 Rio that was perfect for the exhibit we were doing. And in the back there was this car, a black car, with, they hadn't washed it in 10 years, it's filled with dust. And I go, what is that car? And they said, oh, that's a Chrysler. You're not interested in that. And I said, but how come it doesn't look like any Chrysler I ever saw in my life? And they said, oh, that's because it was built for uh, Walter Chrysler. And I, go, and I go, really? I said, what are you doing to this car? I said, they were going to sell it. So I brought out my wallet, and they said, no, that's not going to work that way. So it, 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 I convinced them that they, they needed the money. In a, in a year, it went to a private auction in the museum. And by then, I was sold on it. I had to have the car. So we, we got the car out. It was in total shambles. And within a year and a half, we restored the car. And here is its crowning moment in Pebble Beach winning first in class. You know, and uh, so that was a great team, and here we were on the cover of uh, Hemming's Classic Car last September. And I've got to meet the Chrysler family as a result of this, too. And next year we're going to be doing a car show with them at their home. Oh, and here's the latest car that I, I purchased uh, uh, last April. This is a Mustang 3 concept show car. If it looks a little different, that's because it's a two-seater Mustang. It was made by the prototype maker. 
It's the ninth Mustang ever built. It was a pre-production Mustang and the first day to unknown or destroyed, so it's the oldest Mustang in the world known today. And uh, this car was not meant, because it was a pre-production Mustang, it was meant to be destroyed after they showed it in their uh, Ford custom car caravan. They gave it back to the design house and said, destroy the car. The designer of the car, Vincent Garner, got so upset he stole the car. It was missing for seven months. Detroit police found it, tried to return it back to the design house, and they said, we didn't own it anymore. It's owned by Edna Insurance. They collected the insurance, and that's how the car got saved. Uh, the previous owner had it for 48 years, and then uh, I purchased that. So that's, that's a fun car. And all the history of these are, can be found on the website. So enough of me. It's time to talk about Henry, Clark, Henry Austin Clark, Jr. And uh, here, uh, we'll go back to the history here. Henry, uh, the father of Henry Austin Clark, Henry Austin Clark, Sr., was the treasurer of the American Sugar Company in the early 1900s, which processed cane sugar on the very name. We know Jack for us, and that's Henry Austin Clark's uh, father in the back. Upon his father's death, Henry Austin Clark Jr. inherited a large block of Jack Frost stock and was on its board of directors. Where's this house, Hal? South Main Street. South Main Street. South Main Street. Okay, this is South Main Street. Henry Austin Clark Jr. married. Wally Hunter in November 1944 in his naval outfit over there. And I've had some stories. Uh, William Jackson on the, on the website wrote some stories about Henry Austin Clark in his naval days, too, about he was, he was discovering spy outlets and things like that. So there's some really interesting stories about uh, Henry Austin Clark Jr. in his naval uh, 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 responsibility, so that's kind of cool. This is uh, Wally's children. Where are you, Hal? Is that you there? There's Hal over there. Cynthia over there. Jim and Ann. Okay, what year is this? Mid-50s. Mid-50s. In 1951, the Clark family moved to Meadow Springs in Glen Cove, and he had his library there, and you can see he kind of spread out. <laughs> you remember this, Hal? That's the basement over here. That's his desk over here. This is the dining room table. <laughs> he obviously had a very understanding wife. Uh, these are his business cards here. It gives you, gives you a feeling for his sense of humor here. Photographer of old claws and young girls. Meadow Street, Glen Cove. Says counterfeiting and traffic. Election. All girls. Henry Austin Clark Jr. These are the things that he aspired to, Hal says. Assorted nuts and bolts. And here's the museum. In 1948, uh, the, the museum was begun here. They, everybody knows where the museum is. It, it used to stand out totally. Now you can drive right by it. I've had people on the website say, where was that museum? They said, I can't find it. And they said, I, I've been looking back and forth and back. It's, it's totally covered up, but the, the main buildings are still there. And we'll, we'll, we'll do it now and then, but show it is. But here's the, um, the invitation. Wally and Austin Clark invite you to attend the press preview of the Long Island Automotive Museum, Friday, August 27, 1948. And here, this is the classic photo of the opening day here. Anybody uh, in the audience in this picture? No, but Howard, yeah. Swede has a, a little story about this day. Swede? Yeah. Where's, where's Swede? Swede was the official mascot, I believe, right? I was there, but I wasn't in the but, but, get in the picture. But, but Swede, you were saying you rode your bike, but... Jimmy, we named about 15 people, Morris Cargans in there, Morris Hopper. 
And who are the children in the front? What, excuse me, sweet? They want to Yeah, on the right, and Jerry Nicholas. That's what I was told. I don't know. Okay. The other thing I never saw was the helicopter. The helicopter, and, and we have a we have a better view of the helicopter. Here's the helicopter over here. I think uh, he he hired the helicopter because there was a parade through Southampton to the museum, and I we I've always seen this picture, and then a, a couple of years ago. I got a call from Walter McCarthy, uh, who's a friend of Henry Austin Clark Jr., and he said, you know what, I have this old film on 16 millimeter that I believe shows the museum being open, and I said, well, give that to me and we'll convert it. And, uh, and he, I, I said, as long as you can let me, I can show it on my website and also at presentations like that. So here is that film. Let's uh, hit down the lights a little bit. And the film is pretty good, except the one problem with it is the helicopter's a little shaky. <laughs> yeah. You know, they didn't have steady cam back then. But you'll get a feel for it, and you'll see uh, Southampton, what it looked like in 1948. So let's see. the temporary sign up there. There's the helicopter. There they go. Very shaky. going to the museum. Do you recognize the street? They're making the turn onto the museum. That's 27, right? Yeah. This is a cemetery. And there's the museum. It is glory. film of the museum in action. And there's you got the Oldsmobile on the top there. Who's that, Hal? Do you know? Jerry? He loved trucks, obviously.
This is Joe Tracy. Joe Tracy worked at the museum. Joe Tracy was a very famous race car driver. He participated in three Vanderbilt Cup races. Children really got an appreciation of the, of the automobiles at the museum. You can see, they enjoyed it. That's a Treadwell. There you go, that's the film. I think it really gives you a sense of how much fun the museum was and how much fun people had going there. It's great. Here's some uh, some various shots. I mean, uh, Walter McCarthy uh, gave me uh, his collection of photos and he had about 400 photos of the museum. So these are kind of the selected few. This is uh, uh, Montague Roberts who uh, who participated in the 1908 uh, uh, New York to Paris race, and uh, and they had the Thomas car was the was the key car at the museum, and you can see on the the uh, different posters that was the uh, the Thomas flyer that they highlighted. Uh, and that car is right now in the Harrods Museum out in uh, Nevada. This is 1948. Yeah, here it is at the Harris Museum. Yeah, they, they totally restored the car. Yeah, so they took the 1908 photos and they have it exactly like that. I don't know if they run it anymore. Probably not. I think it's at the museum, though, right? Yeah. I think last time I checked it was at the museum. And I think they have the trophy, too. They have the 1908 trophy. Yes, the, the globe. Here's the moon runabout. Dude, this, uh, again, is a great picture of Henry Austin Clark in, in the car. Sweet, do you remember this car? I wrote it in 1952 race for Bill Wood. It was a black man that worked in Clark. Wow. So do we know where that car is today? Wow. Here we go. This is uh, Joe Tracy again. Wait, who are, the, who are these people over here? Jimmy and Al, right? The Wrecking Crew. So you remember Joe Tracy? Oh, yeah. Do you have any uh, thoughts about him? Well, he gave me a ride in Old 16. Old 16. Yeah, he rolled Old 16 in 1906 in the Vanderbilt Cup races. And he was the favorite to win, but he was having tire problems, so he, he didn't finish. And then he came back in 1908 with George Robertson and won the race. But how do you have any rem rem memories of uh, Joe Tracy? Cal, I'm going to give you... Oh, wait, 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 wait. The most interesting thing he ever told me was that when you, when you drive a tricycle at speed, you lean outside going around the corner. Lean in and he's in trouble. And that's in 1890, late 90s, Leon Bouton. So, and he, he used to race it around the yard. So he taught us how to drive. He, he did. <laughs> oh, and here, this is a, a picture that uh, uh, Gearman, uh, he's here in the audience today, and he wrote about the kingdom of a kid growing up in the long lost Hamptons, and this is Jeff. Jeff, why don't you step, step up and tell us about your book? Uh, let's see, that's 1967. My mom, Pat, is on the left. She's 93 today. Uh, she lives uh, in Pennsylvania, which is where I live. My sister Meg uh, is a middle school dancer and a musician up in Rochester. 
And uh, I have a chapter in the book on uh, the human decision, which was a candy story. Uh, um, it's a great one. I also have a chapter in the book on the good chance of which was uh, one of the problems. How is dad's um, accomplishment in spirit? And uh, one of the folks I interviewed today was Mario Andretti, who lived in New York Bay in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. And I was there the day that Mario met Paul Newman. Uh, Mario was uh, racing Paul Newman's car back in 1967. So, uh, but uh, thank you, Howard, and thank you, Hal, for keeping it going. I wish that uh, it would be, you know, a shrine for something to be created on that lot. Uh, it's very hard to find, as you know. Right. It's a very important place for one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Oh, here, this is a picture of Henry Austin Clark Jr. working at the museum in his work jacket here. And here's a close-up of it. And I once went to an auction, and I went for a different day. They were doing selling Vanderbilt Cup races programs. I got all excited, and then all of a sudden, there's things coming up from the museum. And I said, whoa, where did that come up? And so here's something that I bought. This is in front of the Sandy Hollow Fire Department. That's a fiddle, and it came from South End. That's a fiddle? It's a fiddle, and it came from South End. <laughs> and then it was restored by another guy in Far Quarter Track, and now it's in Alaska. It's in Alaska, wow. <laughs> All yeah. picked up like Randall, the postcard of it in front of his house. Wow. Yeah, a biddle, so I mean, uh, another very rare car. And it came from the H.H. Rogers estate. Right. In Southampton? Yep. The Rogers from the Rogers Memorial <coughs> Library? No. no? Different Rogers? Okay. Uh, this is uh, the Sandy Hollow uh, Fire Department captain and badges, and he gave these out to his friends um, as part of the fire department. I, I, I heard a story of Wally McCarthy we, when we gave this presentation in, in Beth Page, Wally McCarthy was there, and he said that they put an order in for these badges, and the, the person who made it says, where's this fire department? We never heard of this fire department. He said, we never had such a, a, a big order for such a fire department, you know, 500 badges they had made up. I had a... You have one of those? I had a hat for years. It says S.H. And I figured it was a side car to fire. Wow. Yeah. Now, they hear this fire truck, uh, again, this kind of represents Henry Austin Clark Jr. He, I, he just loved enjoying uh, taking a whole bunch of kids and, and giving them rides over here. I think it's the Pope Hartford. It's a Pope Hartford? I think. And here it is. You know this uh, fire truck, right? This is, uh, I think, the Southampton fire truck. Uses to break this out every July 4th. 
right? They still have it, yeah. And this is one of the aspects of the museum was, oh, do you have something there, Al? When he built the museum, he had to extend the building out to put the parking ladder in for number one truck at the building in 1948 by the town. Unlike most collectors, when he closed the museum in 1979, 1980, he gave it back to the town. And that's why you see it every fourth of July. And they're very proud of it. And we had a bunch of them. The, the firemen came out on the best page, and they, they just thoroughly enjoyed the uh, the fire truck. Very, uh, they're proud of their restoration of it too. Uh, one aspect of the museum was the Long Island Iron Range, where there were various parts of automotive for vintage cars that were at the museum. And every so often, there would be a special. Uh, Iron Range Day, where they had special sales, where uh, collectors and vintage car owners would come out and just find a part that they could use for their cars. And here he is, uh, in some of the the, 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 the many shelves of, uh, of of lights and batteries and bulbs. It just went on forever inside the, inside the museum. Here's some of the more famous cars that went down to Southampton parades. Anybody remember that car? And here's the clown car. Now, uh, this clown car, I think, is owned by, currently owned by a Southampton resident, too. What, who's that? That's an auto car up there? Wow. It had a bunch of... Park benches on the back. Over here. Sweet Adelines. Sweet Adelines? All right. Yeah. Sweet Adelines. And the circus car had two levers and one on each side. And they were an emergency brake on one wheel. And you could shift a weight back car would go up. It had a little tiny wheel just before the rear end would touch down behind it. And, the tires. and uh, if you pulled on one of the levers, it would spin one way and the other would go the other. <laughs> I rode in it when I was about 10 years old at the 4th of July parade. I gradually turned green as we got down. <laughs> you went up and down. <laughs> I'll tell you the rest. <laughs> Now, throughout the 70s, there were various auctions at the museum. Um, and this is Henry Austin Clark Jr. He was always, I guess, in charge. He was the auctioneer for this. And uh, I, I must say, I, I had a, one of the things I got from Wally McCarthy was a program that listed all the cars. And I, I, beautiful cars and the prices that these cars went for. Anybody who bought a car at this auction was really thrilled about it. I mean, thousand dollar cars that are either hundreds of thousands of dollars over here. And here it is, it, it always drew out a big crowd here. Here's the inside of the museum during one of the auctions as well. Here's one of my favorite photos <laughs> of Henry Austin Clark. How much am I offered for this genuine solid gold hunk hunk? <laughs> Uh, this is a, a great picture too. That that's uh, Henry Austin Clark on the right, and then there's Wally McCarthy on the left there, and, and Walt Gosden, who was one of his secretaries there, is a good friend of mine as well. A locomobile. Which car is that? I think it's a locomobile. That's a locomobile. And this is uh, Walt Gosden. I think uh, this is a car that Walt Gosden uh, bought. Uh, at one of the auctions there from Henry Austin Clark. Uh, here's another classic uh, uh, photo here. He has a drink in his hand and a smile, and he, he, he's ready to go. The Carnival of Cars, the, the museum was uh, expanded, uh, I'm not sure of the year, in the 70s? 1953. 1953, and this is the Times Square area. 
The Times Square, they opened up a little extension of it, the Carnival of Cars. It lasted nine months. It was nine months. They closed it all up. And here, it, here is, uh, it, I think this is at the opening there, that's uh, Charles Adams, I guess, on the, on the right there, right, from the Adams family. And this is, oh, I remember this, Sonny Fox. So you remember Sonny Fox? So this is on, uh, he had a uh, morning show. So here's uh, Henry Austin Clark Jr. being interviewed by Sonny Fox. Wonderama, Wonderama, yes. Uh, he also was the uh, was one of the heads of the Madison Avenue uh, Driving and Chowder Society. Sports car, yes, and I'm a member of it. I think you're right. Yes, and so this was this is a classic. Yeah, that's Richard M. Dixon. <laughs> they, they introduced him as the president of the United States at the club. Right. And that, 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 the society is still going. It, the second Tuesday of every uh, month, they meet at Sardi's. Oh, and this is, he, he got involved in, in like, uh, Long Island celebrations. And this is, a, again, a photo from uh, Walter McCarthy. And this is when the Islanders won the championship. And you can see he's driving the car, but he doesn't, this is one of the few pictures he's not happy. Because people are like, going around the car and they're scratching the car and he just um, I, I heard stories he was not happy that there was such well, a crowd. He wasn't happy because they broke the rear windshield and they put dual and they had a window that pulled it forward. Yeah, so, but you can see the expression there. That's, that's one of the few photos you can see. He's going, oh my God, why did I get involved with that? That's, and that's the Stanley Cup there. That's uh. That's right there in uh, Mitchell Field. You can see the hangars in the background there, so Community College. Cover photograph of the Long Island. Oh, really? Oh, wow. And then uh, the sad farewell was uh, there were various years where they closed. This is in uh, September of 1980. Wally and Austin Clark invite you for cocktails, a last look, and a sad farewell to the museum. And here, here's kind of a picture years later at the museum as they said goodbye. In uh, the 1980s, Henry, uh, he donated his literature collection to the Henry Ford Museum. And apparently there were like five vans. There was some amazing amount of vans. And I, I still don't think they've unpacked everything over there at the museum. Because I went there to visit it. And they said, well, that's in a box. And we're going to get the box there. But uh, uh, yeah, the final two vans made the transfer in December of 1991. 54,000 pounds. 54,000 pounds of literature. Oh. Wow. Amazing. And some great photos, too. He, you know, when I was invested, when I did my book on the Vanderbilt Cup races there, um, they had a whole bunch of photos I had never seen of the Motor Parkway and the Vanderbilt Cup races, and they came from, from the, his collection. So here's a, some, the Long Island Automotive Museum, then and now, here. Here's what uh, it looked like in the 1960s at the intersection, and you can see how overgrown it is over here, and like I said, you can drive right by, you, you, you won't even see it. Here, and here it is. This is exactly from the same spot in here. This is what looked 1952, and it's, it's covered up. Which is good, too, because we, I, I think Hal doesn't want trespassing in the area, too, so, so he doesn't want people to really know that it leaves there, which I don't blame you here. Here, here it is again what it looked like in 1952, and there are still some letters up there from the museum. Here's uh, the Sandy Hollow Fire Department, and the remnants of the building still there. This is kind of interesting, that sign is still there. They remember that, they had never removed that sign, so the remnant of that sign is still there. Is that the white opera coop? Yes. Over there, that's the white opera coop. I think. Yes, and the White Opera Coupe, you know, many of the um, the cars were made into knickknacks and things. And the, that White Opera Coupe, that's amazing that you should mention that. You can see an ashtray over there, which was one of the ashtrays that was sold 
at the museum, too, so you, you might get a kick out of looking at that. And uh, looking over there, too, uh, George Krug, who came in from Farmingdale today, he uh, brought some of the postcards, and the postcards are... Uh, those are one of the things that is like 500, at least 500, maybe even more, of different um, cars that were not only at the museum, but in various collections in the 50s. And it, it's a great record of it. So George brought in that uh, it brought the postcard. But what George brought in, too, which was really special, he brought in an original bag from the museum over there, too, which I had never seen before. And it's, the bag is a collectible over there. So, so we thank George for bringing that in as well. In November 10th, uh, 1990, there was a surprise testimonial dinner where all his friends gathered as, as well. Um, and uh, that's uh, Walt Gosden in the background. And again, here, here's one of my favorite photos of Henry Austin Clark Jr. And, and his friends enjoying the museum. And I think he would really appreciate that everybody came out to, to really give him a tribute today. So we salute you, Henry Austin Clark Jr. We remember what you did, and uh, you know you're you're a symbol of, of what you really can do to enjoy life. Who's driving the fire truck? Who's driving the fire? That's a good question over I here. This is Gary Cooper's boy. Really? I think. This is pictures of Gary Cooper and Harold and Mercer at the same time and a bunch of cars the same day. That picture was taken. Oh, good. I, you get it. As the town historian, I'm going to research that and find out who is the lady driving the car. But again, thank you for your... Uh, is that Charlie Tom hanging off the rear? Over here? On the rear. It could be Alec Goldman. I'm not 100% sure. So we're, we're going to do identify the photos, which is good. So we can open up for questions, not only to me, but we got a great... Great crowd. Yes, question in the back. I've got a question. I just want to talk about that 1912 American of France ladder truck. Yes. As you said it was given back to us in 1980, originally owned by the Bill of Sally Hampton. Um, it was restored by the likes of Punky Downs and Maurice and Evie, a slow requirement. That truck has won us a lot of awards. Uh, we've been featured in the 1986 Cotton Bowl Parade in Texas. We were in the Orange Bowl in Orlando, Florida. We were in the Shenandoah Apple Blossom Festival featured the truck. And I believe uh, we were requested to the Rose Bowl, but we declined because they wanted to put Rose Bowl in the truck. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and now presently, uh, last year in, uh, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, there was uh, we call it the National Pump Primus Contest with a bunch of antique pumpers and trucks. And we won Contestant's Choice, which is the most biggest award. That comes from everybody who likes to view. And uh, we'll be featured this year at the event coming up July 12th. Uh, we're going to be on all the memorabilia, the, the mugs, the plates, the shirts. Well, that's great. We won a lot of coveted awards with that truck. Good. So it's in great hands. We're going to take questions, but those of you who have these particular comments and stories. If you might be willing later on, like November 3rd, maybe, to be in an oral history program about the, his, about the Automotive Museum. Uh, Swede has said yes already. And Hal may be able to come. If he's able to come, we, we really will be happy. But several of you who have worked there in the past or know a lot, give me your um, contact info before you go. And if you're willing to participate in some way. I want to do a little bit more of an oral history a program, possibly at the Historical Museum, an informal. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, okay, good. Good. So, yes. What's that? They didn't come. He was the oldest employee there, but he said he can't drive at night. No, he wouldn't go. So we'll have to contact him. What's his name? Gene Mott. He lives in East Penn. Okay. 2560 is his phone number. <laughs> there you go. Yes, we have a question or comment or story. Please tell us any story that you want to share. I'll, I'll share one that I told him to dance uh, service after he passed. Um, he liked to go out for lunch, uh, usually have a drink or two at lunch. And one day, a very cold winter day in Glen Cove, left the library, uh, driving down 
the road toward Locust Valley, runs out of gas, pulls over to the side, and the first vehicle that pulls up is a hearse. <laughs> and he and Beverly Kimes, who with, with Dad wrote the book on all the cars produced in the U.S. pre-World War II, very noted author of automotive books and, and articles, jumped in the front seat. The driver, I guess, sensed that they might be a little bit uncomfortable and leaned over and said, first, first time in a hearse, and Dad said, that, that, this, this life, anyway. <laughs> So he always had a good time and a great sense of humor. The, the one message I would want to leave with you is, I think his generosity was beyond belief. He, he gave more than half of his estate to the Ford Museum when they drove off with the 54,000 pounds of literature. And I had an experience two years ago in Monterey selling, unfortunately selling one of the great cars um, that I couldn't uh, keep with three children. I couldn't cut it in three pieces. and It wanted to go 100 miles an hour from 1911, 33 horsepower Mercer race about. I'm sure. And uh, one of the great cars, he thought the greatest car built in the U.S. pre First World War. And I was getting ready to go in, put it on the, drive it up on the block because they sold the car is his, is his car, and they wanted a member of the family to drive it. He'd given it to me when I was 13, I think. But uh, in the auction business, that counts as one owner. <laughs> it's true of art, too. Uh, and anyway, there was a delay. I couldn't figure out what was going on, and finally got in, and the 3,000 people in the audience were applauding because they had showed the video that you can go on to the RM auction website and, and find, which is about a four or five minute interview about him. And what they were really applauding was the fact that he, he didn't buy and sell cars. He saved cars. He never really sold cars other than the three auctions when he was closing the museum back when the prices were pretty low, as he right. said. Um, but he put them in the hands of people who would take care of them and restore them. And he got a lot of cars for nothing because he towed them out of junkyards or he'd get a call from a World War II widow and drag six or eight. I remember one day we took about eight cars out of a garage on, on uh, First Nick Lane. And within three days, four or five of them were gone into the hands of people who really wanted those cars and would fix them up, put them back on the road. So I think the appreciation for his collecting the literature back when no one really cared about it, and most people threw it out, and putting cars in the hands of people who otherwise wouldn't have afforded the, the, the uh, fix-up, restoration, just rebuilding costs, uh, made him somewhat of a legend. And that came through in that auction. It was really quite a touching moment. The other thing he did, the two, great remembrances I have of the auctions. There were two guys that came down from Canada, I think the Maritimes, and they wanted to take a car to the uh, London to Brighton Run. And he had that unrestored curb dash alls from 1903. It had to be very old. And they had a set amount of money. He found out what it was. And when they got to their price and their bid, he banged the gavel down and annoyed the hell out of half the people there. But he wanted to see it taken over to London and run the way it should have been. That was one story. And there was another fire truck in the American La France Gorgeous, smaller truck that looked like the one that you had up when everyone came in. And the town wanted to get it back. They'd sold it some years ago. And they spent the year going into the auction having clam bakes and bake sales and the kind of things the fire departments do. And likewise, the bidding was going very strongly. He knew what their number was of the money they'd raised. And the minute they got to it, he banged the paddle down and got it back to the town that it come from. Oh. So those are two of my very fond really nice. memories of, of my dad. Was the building purpose built as a museum or did it predate the museum? 
surplus World War II airplane hangar. Your father built the building? Why don't you give your name and tell us the story about how that building was built? Yeah. You want to stand up? My name is uh, Chuck Geos, and my father was working at uh, Durian Bay after the war. He'd been in the Seabees, and uh, they had a lot of parts up there that didn't know about where they went, and uh, they started to put the building together. And uh, it, it, I, mean, I remember because I used to go up there with him and uh, just watch and mess around and whatever, but uh, it was uh, it was a big job to put all that together. And uh, they also did some of the, the uh, things out in the backyard at other times. To, uh, but, uh, Quonset. Quonset. Right. But it was originally designed for the museum, correct? It was designed, it was a surplus building. But but the idea was that was the museum, right? Yes. And I, I think in uh, Walter McCarthy's he has actually one of the designs with the architects, the original design. I'll put I'll put that up on the website. But it's great. So you got all of them, all right? That's great. Yes. Any chance of the museum making a comeback? <laughs> uh, well, yes. That's a good question. You know, there's a whole bunch of people on Long Island that really want to have a museum. There's not an automotive museum in the United States that makes any money. So you really, the only way that you get a museum is uh, someone with deep pockets comes in and gets involved with it and, uh, and the government sometimes finances things. It's really a shame though, you think about it, there's probably the greatest collection of automobiles anywhere in the United States is right here in Long Island and there's not a great place for anybody to see it. You know, so um, someday maybe there's, there's some talk about it, um, but it, uh, I'm not optimistic that's going to happen, unfortunately. Yes? My name is John Rippin. I work here. Can you give him the uh, microphone, please? How can you give me the mic? Yeah, hold yeah, on a I need it. The camera. Oh, here you go. You have to hold it up. Chuck Gale's dad and my dad are very good friends, and I worked at the museum probably the first year or second year after it opened in 48 and 49. Gene Martin was ahead of me and I worked with Gene and Bill Woodby and our jobs were mainly janitorial and one of the biggest jobs was keeping all the brass polished on all those automobiles. Wow. And uh, I had a black forefinger for three years. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, anyway, it may have been, be of interest how those buildings were coated because my dad and my grandfather went to work within a paint firm called Fordham and Elston and my dad knew Austin Clark very well and consequently as a result of that and also the fact that we had to research what to put on those buildings because they were galvanized steel consequence. Galvanized steel, mainly galvanizing is zinc. Am I right Chuck? Thank you. <laughs> we discovered a paint manufacturing company in Brooklyn, New York, called the Devil Boys Paint Manufacturing Company, and they had a product called 555 Gray. It came in two containers. One was a gallon-sized container that was short-filled. On the top of that gallon container was the same diameter, smaller container of dry zinc dust. These two had to be mixed together. And we did it in five gallon batches, and that mixing machine is on exhibit at the Southampton Historical Museum. And the five gallon batches had a pot life. Those buildings were hand brushed. Every inch of those buildings was coated with the 555 gray. And then aluminum paint was put on the roofs, which go from the valleys all the way to ground level. All hand brushed. You can, you can imagine guys on the roof handing off the brush and a guy on the ladder below. And in one of the aerial photographs that you perhaps saw, the roofs were shiny and the sidewalls were still gray. 
they're very great now, but I'm, I'm here to say that probably that was the original coating that was put on, even though it's rusted from beneath, but it lasted very, very well. And believe it or not, you can't put zinc or lead in any paint now, but you see what happens when you do. And it was a very good product and kept all of our employees working for a very long time. And, it was very <laughs> <laughs> and the blue was a DuPont blue, special uh, custom blue, and the white trim was a DuPont paint. And I'm here to answer any questions if you ever want a building done. <laughs> <laughs> For a long lasting feature. Thank you so much. Sorry. Does anyone else have a story there? Yes, that's sweet. You had mentioned a connection to the Bridgehampton Racetrack. Yes. Did you? Yes. Uh, I think uh, Henry Austin Clark Jr. was one of the uh, Original directors, Earl. You probably could tell us. Yeah. Yes, Earl. Give the, the mic to Earl over here. Over here. Earl, introduce yourself and tell us your background. Yeah, I'm, uh, Earl Gandell. I was uh, one of the operators of the racetrack from 19 uh, in the later days, 1980. Well, I'm sorry, 1970 to about 1985. Um, and Steve Steve Halsey is sitting here who, when he was in high school, worked for us at the track. Uh, you know, Austin Clark was on the board of uh, Bridgehampton Road Races Corporation, uh, which uh, created the track, uh, bought the land, uh, had the track built, and that was a result of the racing that went on on the streets in Bridgehampton in 49 through 53. And they wanted to continue racing, so they built a purpose-built a purpose track for that purpose. And uh, it, it, the track was recognized as one of the best racetracks in the world by a lot of uh, drivers who knew what they were talking about, like Mario Andretti and um, Carol Shelby. Um, uh, the board at the time was uh, Austin Clark, uh, Henry Austin Clark, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, B.J. Corrigan was the chairman or president. Um, uh, Hewlett Treadwell, uh, Alfred Momo, who was very famous in the racing world. Uh, was a, he was a, in the early days. He was a mechanic for um, Briggs Cunningham in the street racing. And he built his own his own very successful business. Uh, who else? Um, was it Crom the lawyer? Crom. Hmm? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Crom and. Who was the lawyer? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's the one that was telling me to put the place in the hole. <laughs> 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 he was a partner in the law firm. One is in the law firm sued for all the time that he gave the racetrack free. So they, 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 they sent an enormous bill to the racetrack, and that's what started when it got in the hole. Yeah, but there were, there were a lot of things that went on like that. that <laughs> and that's how it became a golf club, right? Uh, before, before we took it on, before we took it on, the operator, they, uh, uh, in effect, they leased the track to the operators of the track. Uh, we were one of the last ones. Uh, before us, there was a guy named Arthur Schmidt, who was from Huntington, and he was he ran the track during the Trans Am and Can Am days and the, the, the big days. Uh, Arthur Schmidt was not a was not well loved by Henry Austin Clark, and, and Austin had a, a different name for Arthur Schmidt. <laughs> um, but that's. Anyway, that, you know, the, the brief history of the track. Yeah, and one of the things that they did at the track on the big races is they had a vintage rally, car rally before, and I've seen some pictures of uh, Joe Tracy participating in that, and that 42 uh, Duesenberg that I think was at the museum, that, that was always showed up at the Bridgehampton vintage rallies as well, which was very good. Yes, right. That's good. One question I wanted to ask: How do you remember Christopher? Christopher, the dog. The little black, was a black yeah. Back. He was in one of the pictures. He was in one of the pictures. I think he was in the fire truck. Yeah. He that black uh, 
Cocker Spaniel went everywhere Clark went. And then in 1956, somebody shot him with a pellet gun. And the veterinarian didn't discover it. He went for two or three months and he died. And he's buried right behind the shed because I buried him. <laughs> he, was Clark, he was, Clark never drove the truck or a car without Christopher with him. You look in the, the race, he's driving with Joe Tracy in the moon. Yes. It says right on it, Christopher is with him. Oh, wow. Austin Clark and Christopher riding with Joe Tracy. That's great. Yeah, the one thing that comes out is, is that Henry Austin Clark Jr. had a big heart, you know, and, and he, he shared it with a lot of people. And, uh, you know, just the number of people that came out for this presentation, uh, you know, I, I was expecting, you know, usually you get about 25, 30 people. It just shows you that, you know, uh, along, although he, he's, he's not been with us for so long, his memory still is there. And, and, and you know, the, the great feelings that he gave to the community still are everlasting. So, again, it, it was a privilege to, to give this presentation, and thanks for all the former employees and for Hal and Sweet to, to come out. Uh, I appreciate it, and I think it made a really memorable evening. Thank you very much. Thank you all again. I think this is one of the, for many here, it was just a completely positive memory of how Southampton was, a, you know, a, quite a while ago. And so I'm really glad you were here. And we really would like to get more stories. So I have a little pad back there. Please come sign your name, even if you want to be recorded sometime, just for 10 minutes. That's fine. Um, because I think we're going to be able to transcribe this and just keep it here in the Long Island collection. It's an important part of our history. Thank you, Hal and Sweet and Jeff and Howard and, and all the rest of you who came out tonight. Thanks. Thanks for having me.